Welcome to the program. Today we are going to begin a discussion about what I believe is one of the single most important trends and topics that we will be talking about for a very long time and is, by all accounts from people smarter than myself, a topic that will change human life as we know it, whether for the better or for the worse, but it will fundamentally change our experience with technology and potentially even with each other. The topic we're going to begin discussing today, and I say begin because there's so many different areas that we need to explore, and some of that will require guests, experts, um, expert guests for us to be able to fully appreciate. Uh, that topic is artificial intelligence and its implementation and its growing capacity thanks to the investments of many private companies uh, as well as academic researchers and others. And of course, in 2023, the big development of um, OpenAI's application, the chat GPT, which allowed for the first time the general public to begin to interact in a fairly sophisticated way with a chatbot that could, in theory at least, carry on a conversation with you um, using all the knowledge of the internet that it could uh, teach itself on to produce answers to common questions with a fairly conversational style. Um, I'm underselling the impact of what that tool is, but what made it scary for some people, but also fascinating for others, was how human-like it, it was in its ability to very quickly synthesize information and present it back to us, uh, regardless of the accuracy of some of that information. And so it brought to light a topic that has been part of scientific discovery for a fairly long time, at least as long as computers have been part of the equation. Uh, and that is to what degree can technology replace human beings? And up to this point, that was often in a physical sense, the assembly line, for instance, technology that could replace people's physical labor. But for the first time, artificial intelligence brings to the forefront the potential that our minds can be replaced, that creative jobs could be replaced, that some of the basic things that we think of as being human could in fact be taught to a machine to mimic us and to do creative tasks better than we can do them. It's a fascinating thought, but I think it's being perceived in potentially the wrong way or at least we're not thinking about it to its fullest extent. So the reason I wanted to record this particular program and, and give you some of my thoughts is because I think it's important for us all, as you listen to the shows of the future on this topic, I think you should know my baseline perception uh, from how I'm thinking about it and how I'm seeing it. And I want, I want us, you and me, our, the audience, uh, this community that we're building, this community of curious minds, I, I want us to start to consider our own baseline for this. Because every time I talk with somebody about the topic of artificial intelligence off the record, outside of the confines of this show, I learn something new and my mind is often changed. So I think it's important for us to know where we're starting on this baseline and occasionally check in with each other and see as we learn more and hear more and read more how our opinions start to evolve and change. Um, and so I think it's only fair to share with you some of my initial reactions, uh, where I am thinking about this today. It, it's recording the third episode in, in this uh, podcast series, and it may change over time. And so I hope this is a landmarker for, for me, and I hope you will respond to some of my initial thoughts because I really want to know what the curious minds of the world think about what I think is one of the most important topics that we are going to be covering on this program in terms of long-term trends and how all of our lives are likely to be shaped by things like technological innovations. Before I go into the details of that, I want to, uh, number one, make sure you know how to get in touch with me. 
info, info at brianjmatos.com is probably the most direct way to get in touch with me through my uh, production team. You can find me on Twitter at Brian J. Matos. You can tweet me publicly or do a direct message. I'm on Facebook, Brian.Matos. Everybody knows, I think, those who are on that tool, how to get in touch with me there. I do have an Instagram, Brian J. Matos is where you can find me there. Of course, you can always visit my website for the latest episodes and my thoughts in blog form at BrianJMatos.com. And for those who prefer to get their podcasts on YouTube, I do have a YouTube channel. It's Brian J. Matos Podcast. That's Brian J. Matos Podcast, all one big long word. Uh, And I post new episodes there about a day after I get them posted to the feed, which, of course, you can subscribe to through my website or anywhere that you get your podcasts. Um, And we are now, I believe, available on Google Podcasts as well, which I don't think we were for the first episode. So those are all the ways you can get in touch with me, and I do want you to get in touch with me. And as I mentioned on previous shows, if you want your thoughts or your reactions shared on this program, I simply ask that you include first name, last initial, tell me where you're from, and I will attribute those comments back to you. I have received some good feedback from the first couple of episodes. Please keep it coming. And again, the most direct way to get in touch with me through my production team is info, I-N-F-O, at brianjmatos.com. All right, let's get into the the nuts and bolts of the artificial intelligence conversation I want to have today. And there's there's really only a few key points that I want to make because we are just kicking off this conversation, and I don't want my thoughts today to be perceived as declarative of where I think I will be through all the conversations that have yet to be had on this program. First and foremost, I want to begin by sort of posing a question that I hope you will all give me the privilege of of responding to. At what point does artificial intelligence just become intelligence? Independent intelligence, I suppose we could call it. Where exactly is that threshold? Because if we think about what artificial intelligence means in its current definition, it, it really just means technology that has been trained by humans to mimic human intellect without truly having an independent ability to think exclusively on its own and without some of the other, I suppose, non-intellectual elements that play into human intellect, like emotions, like memories, experiences. So I, I think there is a distinction between artificial intelligence and human authentic intelligence. But will we ever know as the technology advances when it's no longer artificial, when it's no longer a creation of people and researchers and academics and scientists, when this intelligence gains its own independent ability to continue to learn and break free from whatever made it artificial to begin with. I don't have an answer to this, but I think it's important perhaps that we begin any conversation with anybody that we have on this topic about the very nature of the words that we use to describe it. Artificial intelligence. What makes it artificial, and how will we know when the word artificial has to be dropped and we have to start thinking about this technology purely as intelligence potentially on par with or maybe even better than most common human intelligence now the next foundational point to be made on this concept of of artificial intelligence is that i think we should be thinking about it in the narrow scope of that very term intelligence the ability to learn and the ability to interpret and analyze and produce thoughts and recommendations and suggestions and answers to to questions. Here's what we don't necessarily need to include in the conversation at this point. One of the things that makes human intellect what it is, is that it is influenced inevitably by all of those things that make us uniquely human, such as our emotions such as our experiences and 
biases that come with those experiences and our instincts shaped in many cases by the experiences we've had in our lives. We don't know at this point whether any artificial intelligence model is going to be able to include anything like that. We also don't really understand even how human beings adapt their intellectual capacity to their environment because of their experiences. So one way to think about this is that you can have two very highly intelligent individuals, people who can process huge amounts of information, who could ace any standardized test, who retain a lot of information and do so quickly, and they process information faster than the rest of us. You could have two people like this, very, very smart academic types. But if one of them is in their 70s and one of them is in their 30s, that intellect is likely to show up in different ways because the intellect, even if they both studied the same basic material, is influenced by all the experiences of their lives that are unique to those two individuals. So two people with very similar IQs could still apply their intellect and come to different conclusions because the 70-year-old has simply seen seven decades worth of things and they've lived experiences that have informed how they process information and how they come to the conclusions they come to. And a 30-year-old has different sets of experiences unshaped by 40 of the 70 years of the elder that we're comparing them to. None of us expect that artificial intelligence, however it ultimately manifests itself, is going to fully be able to compare to human intellect that's been informed by a lifetime of experiences and the instincts that that creates in you because you've had those experiences. But it's also worth discussing and noting that artificial intelligence will have experiences of its own. It may even develop instincts of its own, but it will be unique to itself. How those machines ultimately not just learn information, but learn when they were right and when they were wrong and how they were treated in certain instances and whether those machines have the ability to develop instincts of their own that are not specifically programmed into them or learned through a traditional learning model. We don't really know, but I think these these two topics of at what point does intelligence become just intelligence and it's no longer artificial, and what does intellect mean in the context of our human experiences and biases and the instincts that we develop with them? I think these are very foundational questions that we each have to think about for ourselves. And I'm not here to say I have a perfect answer to when we drop the artificial from artificial intelligence or whether or not experience and instincts are critical components of the application of intellect. But I do think that all of us have to reflect on that as we get into this conversation. And I invite you to do so, and I hope that we'll hear back from you specifically on those two very foundational points. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say about artificial intelligence as we get into these conversations. Number one, I think it's in going to be a powerful assistant rather than a replacement. Much like other technologies, including computers, which I am recording into right now, they didn't replace us. They made us more efficient. They did replace typewriters for word processing, and they did replace, you know, in some cases, things like the need for calculators, because now you could have a spreadsheet do these auto calculations for you. Um, they eliminated the need for, for some people, they eliminated the need to have a television because now they could stream everything they wanted on their phone, on their uh, computer. Uh, but the point is, it became supplemental to us. It didn't replace us all. Computers became an ever-present part of our lives, first in the workplace, then in our homes, and then pretty much everywhere that we are, for everything, from checking out of grocery stores to um, checking into our flights. It's become a, a constant to us. And I believe artificial intelligence will act much the same way for a long time. I think 
what it will help us do is process information far faster than we can ever do it for ourselves, just like computers do for us today. Um, and it will be greatly beneficial to us to have these sort of in-home and in-office assistants that have an intellect that maybe it matches human intellect or maybe it doesn't, but if it's able to process huge volumes of information and then spit out relatively accurate findings, results, and recommendations, this will be very additive to us. And I think in the best case scenario, most of what we will think of as AI in the future will be a technology that allows us to be smarter, save time, be more efficient. It will allow us to do things faster because we will have access to information quickly. And it will probably make us more attuned to all the data out there that we didn't even know existed. And it will allow us to get more of our questions answered about routine things in life. It, it's not going to be able to answer all of life's biggest questions. But if we're able to fairly quickly query a huge database to get a very simple answer to a very simple question, well, then we can move on to the next question. For people like me, uh, who's in the business of asking questions, that's a very exciting prospect. Now, what is the key effect that we should be thinking about with AI. The key effect to me is the velocity of information, the speed of analysis, of decision making, of reactions, and potentially retaliations. Because if the biggest effect of AI as an assistant is to dramatically increase the speed with which we answer our questions, potentially before we even know we have the questions, it will trigger very quick snap decisions. Because once we have an answer to a question, it usually is a question that we asked because it was going to inform a decision we were going to make. And sometimes it's good to have time between asking the question and getting the answer because it gives your brain more time to process all the possible scenarios. And based on the answer it gets, it may lean one way or the other, but in that time it takes between asking and answering, your brain can go in a lot of different directions. But what if you ask a question, you get an instant answer that allows you to ask the next question that gives you another instant answer. And now you start making decisions in your life based off of this. And now the decisions that used to take you a few hours take you just a couple of seconds. And then your decisions trigger reactions in other people. And those reactions trigger more decisions. Much of what I'm talking about here is the international community. It's international diplomacy. Imagine a government that was able to analyze its intelligence in next to real time using artificial intelligence that not only processed real time intelligence gathering from around the world, but then gave recommendations that allowed anything from intelligence agencies to state departments and foreign ministries to make instant decisions based off of recommendations coming out of artificial intelligence models. And those decisions would then feed into an international series of decisions made by all kinds of players, decisions that may in the past have taken weeks can now be done in seconds. And depending on how automated that system of intelligence gathering and decision making is, that could be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. But either way, I think we already live in a world that feels like it's moving faster than it ever was in our lifetimes. I think one of the big implications of artificial intelligence is going to be speeding up our life to the speed of light. And not everyone's going to be comfortable keeping up at that pace. But imagine a driven individual, and hopefully they're driven by the right motives, who can move faster than everybody around them and stay 15 steps ahead because they've harnessed this technology to make the best possible decisions in the shortest period of time while everybody else is still sitting around and pondering what to do and how to do it. But now imagine a world where we're all empowered by AI. Institutions, governments, academic research organizations, communities, 
even fairly benign organizations like churches or nonprofits. Imagine if all of them are empowered with AI that makes all of them much faster than they've ever been before in making decisions about how they market themselves or making decisions about how they use their finance, their financial reserves, or maybe even how they target a certain audience to take a certain action. I don't even think we've begun to explore the interaction of competing artificial intelligence models against one another. What if there's an AI model in, let's say, Far East Asia, and it's competing in some ways against an artificial intelligence model developed between the United States and Europe. And each of them in interprets information a little bit differently, but they're each interpreting it very quickly and spitting out recommendations to their users. If these systems are not that similar to each other, they could come up with very different results and potentially cause more chaos because neither side really understands how the other is processing the information that both are seeing. Now, as we step away from some of those assumptions about AI, that I believe it will be a powerful assistant rather than a replacement to us, and that I think one of its key effects will be increasing the speed of everything that we do, now we have to get into some other, some other aspects of this. One of the things that makes us uniquely human and unpredictable is emotions. And one of the benefits that's been touted about artificial intelligence is how unemotional it is, that it is fundamentally a logical tool stripped of any emotion. And its proponents say this is good because it removes the potential for bias and it removes the potential for black and white information to be interpreted through a lens that doesn't make sense and that's simply influenced by how somebody feels on a certain day. Now, I have no question that removing emotion has advantages in certain situations, but it has key limitations. And there's three areas of life that I was thinking about this on. Number one, imagine politics anywhere in the world where it's practiced, including, by the way, in countries with authoritarian regimes. Can you imagine politics being run purely on a logical basis? Politics is full of emotion. The best politicians are the ones who connect emotionally with an audience and their voting base, not logically. And while many times public policy makes beautiful sense and has a lot of very good reasons why we would want to do it, until you connect with somebody emotionally and explain how your policy is going to benefit their life, and not just benefit their life in a logical way, but that they can feel, they can truly feel how it will make them better. I can't imagine conducting politics without it. And I know that a tool like AI will be used in politics for the analytical side of that business, literally finding your voters, literally serving up the right content that will resonate with them, but it still has to come down to emotion. AI is not likely to be able to replace that. And in fact, artificial intelligence, it would be hard to imagine how emotion would fully play into the tools the way they're built today. And also think about marketing campaigns. There's no doubt that AI may be used to write some of the text for those campaigns, maybe even create some of the images, but AI is not going to be able to truly have the emotional feel for how something that on paper looks and sounds just fine, but will it really be able to interpret how a cross-section of people who are looking for an emotional connection to a brand are going to interpret what they're seeing? Probably not. Think about protest movements. Protest movements may be based in logic, but they are all about the emotions of a crowd, uh, whether those emotions are anger and sadness or perhaps even joy and love and hope. I don't think AI is going to really be able to do much to impact those. And I also think it'll be interesting to see how what AI produces that it believes is a logical response, given all the information it's been fed, Will it be able to interpret emotions when we, human beings, have a very hard time interpreting each other's emotions? 
we have a hard time interpreting each other culturally. We have a hard time interpreting each other's words. Sometimes we miss each other's sense of humor. We, we miss each other's intentions. We, we miss signals, those unspoken body language elements that give off some sense of emotion, but you have to be attuned to pick it up. I don't think we've spent enough time, even in the foundational aspects of AI, thinking about how emotions, human emotions, are going to play into anything that the tools produce, not to mention the tool's ability to interpret what we're asking of it. Because a question asked in rage does fundamentally indicate a different answer than a question asked at peace. At least that's my opinion. We also have not really asked the question about who will govern the most powerful AI tools once they become more autonomous than what the current generation is, and especially those that may have the ability to be dangerous. Right now, private companies and some academic researchers are developing these tools, but are they really the ones that we want to govern these powerful tools? Imagine if uh, the nuclear bomb were developed by a private lab, independent of any government funding, research, or authorization. Would you want to have Amazon or Netflix in possession of a nuclear weapon and have it governing when and where and how it could potentially be used? Probably not. But then again, a lot of us don't necessarily trust our governments with it either. So what will we trust who will we trust? How can we trust anyone with the most powerful AI tools that have yet to even be truly developed? What responsibility will that governing body have to be transparent about how it's using these tools? Will governments fundamentally be willing to let the public see what they're doing in private? as they research different clandestine functions of artificial intelligence? These are questions we should be asking now. And in recent weeks, as I'm recording this program, there's been a call from a lot of researchers to, you know, quote-unquote, pause the, the research around artificial intelligence. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. I don't necessarily think we need to do that. But I do think one of the points they bring up and has been brought up several times in the early iterations of this discussion, is that we do have to understand who and how these powerful tools are going to be governed. Which of them will be in the hands of the private sector, and which will be in the hands of our governments, and which governments? And even as an international community, how are we going to govern, let's call them autonomous intelligence tools, that have the ability to act upon their own recommendations. This may be the most important question left to be had about artificial intelligence, is the governance of the tools once they are fully developed. And then I think it's important that we think about all the different aspects of our human experience that can be influenced, for better or worse, by the advent of these AI tools. I can see implications for the medical community. I can see huge implications in the educational community. I can see scientific researchers and weapons manufacturers and the defense industries of the world being impacted heavily. I can also see diplomacy, international diplomacy, being heavily influenced. And those are just the sectors that have huge implications for all of us. It doesn't even begin to go into all the potential corporate uses, nonprofit uses, charitable uses, um, uses beyond the bounds of this planet that you could potentially use AI to improve or to do things different or better. But if we go back to my initial point about I think AI will be a powerful assistant to us, think about the potential of artificial intelligence aiding doctors as they're trying to diagnose complex medical conditions or catch previously uncatchable early detection of cancers or early signs and signals of the efficacy of particular treatments 
both medicine induced and non medical, non medicine induced treatments. In education, think about how much a child can achieve if a curious child is able to get quick answers to questions that used to take them an entire grade to figure out an answer to. What potential could that child have? And for the kids who might struggle learning, what if artificial intelligence allows teachers to better tailor their lessons to those children to help them achieve more because now they have an aid in the classroom that can be truly everywhere all the time, unlike a single teacher in a classroom of a dozen, two dozen, three dozen kids. Think about the impacts on research. One of the problems with research is that it takes time to analyze all the data that comes in. Well, what if scientific researchers could dramatically shorten that amount of time? What if our models were more accurate than they've ever been before to the point that we could project sooner and faster and earlier what the most likely outcome of any given scenario would be? On potentially the more concerning side, imagine how much more deadly a weapon could be if artificial intelligence allows you to improve your targeting, to improve the range, to allow countries to break through in areas of nuclear capabilities. If artificial intelligence can now allow those countries to learn how to create these weapons of mass destruction in faster, cheaper, more efficient ways than they ever could have on their own because they simply didn't have access to the scientists who had the knowledge. What about international diplomacy? What happens when decisions are made in real time because of an artificial intelligence program that has projected and scenario played out every possible outcome of an international negotiation? And what happens when those diplomats now make decisions and take actions in seconds that used to take them long periods of deliberation to come through? We don't know exactly the implications, but these are the areas we should be thinking about and focusing on as a society sooner rather than later. So to summarize some of my key findings and, and key points as we begin the conversation and the discussion. First and foremost, I want to know when intelligence becomes artificial and when we drop the artificial from intelligence. Where is that point? When is that point? And number two, intellect is just that in the absence of experiences and the absence of human instincts. I think it's important that we keep in keep that in mind both as we continue to see artificial intelligence develop, will it gain its own instinct? Will it have its own experiences? And what will those experiences mean about how AI models develop, specifically how they develop differently than how we as humans develop our own intellect? With that foundation established, I believe AI will be a powerful assistant more than it will be any sort of meaningful replacement of us. I believe that its key effect will be increasing the speed of analysis, decision-making, reactions, and retaliations, and that we all have to be prepared to live in a world that's ever faster in how information is flowing, how decisions are being made, how opinions are being formed, and how we have to be prepared to react to those. I think emotions are what make us human, and what make us unpredictable. And it will continue to be a key challenge for artificial intelligence to navigate human emotion, perhaps a bit like the old Star Trek show with Dr. Spock and how he had a hard time interacting sometimes with us emotional human beings. Fictional character though he may be, it may end up being a very prescient comparison to how AI tools operate in a very human world. Removing emotion may have its advantages, but it also has its limitations. And I just can't imagine things like politics, protests, and marketing campaigns built exclusively on AI logic instead of human emotion. Understanding who will govern these tools as they get more advanced is one of the most important questions we should be and have to be asking ourselves now. And there's not going to be an easy answer because no matter who you pick, there's going to be a reason to be concerned about 
them having control of such a powerful tool. And finally, it's now is a good time to start thinking about the potentials and the risks that AI tools pose to the medical industry, to education at all levels, to scientific research, weapons development, and diplomacy. I'm hoping that this podcast has helped us begin a conversation. I hope it stirs some thoughts in your mind, and I'd love to hear those. Because before we start bringing on our guests to the show to give their opinions that may start changing our minds and shaping us, I think it's important that we come in with some of our own initial thoughts. So if anything that I said today resonates with you, or if you disagree with it, I'd really love to hear from you. I'm reachable online in a number of different formats. My email is info, I-N-F-O, at brianjmatos.com. You can find me at brianjmatos.com, where this and every other show will be posted for you. You can find my podcast series on any of your favorite channels, anywhere you get your podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Brian J. Matos, on Facebook, Brian.Matos, Instagram, Brian J. Matos. And I post these episodes on YouTube the day after they post to my podcast feed and website. You can find me on YouTube at Brian J. Matos Podcast. I would love to hear from all of you about this topic. And I hope, if nothing else, even if you choose not to reach out to me, I do hope you spend some time thinking about it. I hope you spend some time talking with your family about it. I hope you spend some time thinking about it in your workplace, maybe chat about it with your coworkers and colleagues. Maybe think about it in the context of your friend group. And try to take the fear out of it. Try to take the potential politics out of it. So many things in America at least start to fall into political camps. Just start to consider for yourself what life could be like with an artificial intelligence that certainly becomes something more than artificial. What it would be like for you, how you will function in a world where information gets faster and is influenced by these tools, and what concerns you the most, but also what makes you the most optimistic. Start giving it some thought, because this is likely to shape every aspect of our lives and all the various topics that we talk about on this program. I am very interested in hearing from you, and if you have questions, I'd love for you to just pose those to me as well. Uh, and I continue to have the objective of bringing the very best questions, both mine and yours, to the smartest minds we can find on these topics. My producer and I are working vigorously to get our first guests on the program in the next couple of weeks on all variety of topics, uh, not necessarily just artificial intelligence, um, but we will get some of their thoughts on this, one of the biggest trends and biggest issues that we have to deal with as a society. And so I want to be able to bring your questions to those minds. So whether you have thoughts, opinions, or just questions, please send them to me. I look forward to hearing from you and sharing them with our growing community. So until next time, and I will talk to you again next week, this is Brian J. Matos inviting you all to continue listening to this program as we continue our journey of knowledge and learning, and I encourage you all to continue to stay curious. <laughs>